Hey, we're glad that you're here today, Cross Church. It's going to be a great day as we're finishing up the book of Titus today. Titus has all been about, about healthy leaders, produce healthy churches that have a healthy vision to have a healthy mission. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What is it like to live our life on mission in a world that needs to know Jesus? So I hope you'll stay tuned. Well, I am so thankful for you guys letting me be here today. I don't know if you really had a choice, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm thankful. I, I get to come here every once in a while. Um, I love this church. And if I didn't already have a church, this is the church that I would be at. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Monty Patton. I'm best known as Aria and Archers and Arlo's granddad. All right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I love your pastor because I have to, right? <laughs> I love his wife because, well, she's my daughter, you know. I love the kids, grandkids, be honest, more than both of those other two, <laughs> right? So um, I'm so glad. Hey, man, you've, um, you've been coming over these last few weeks, man, and, and been looking at this wonderful book called Titus. And so I'd like you to open up your Bible to Titus chapter 3 because we're going to finish up the, this, this whole um, idea of what the church is supposed to be, and what this church is supposed to look like, the imperatives of a healthy church we're going to find at the very end of this, this wonderful, wonderful book. Now, if this is your first time coming to this church, our church, um, and you don't know, maybe you're just freshly into this Jesus journey, and you hear we're turning to Titus, you may not have any idea who in the world that dude is. Um, let, me, let me explain. There was a guy named Paul okay, that, man, he was a, a, a zealous against Jesus, so much so that he kept throwing people into prison and having them killed for being Jesus followers. But it was on the road one day to go persecute some Christians that he had an encounter with Jesus himself. And it was such a radical uh, encounter that it changed his life from that point on. And from that point on, instead of being such a radical against Jesus, he was radically for Jesus. And he began to start churches all over what we have as Asia Minor. And so while he was doing that, he, be, he began to understand and know that in order to further the gospel, in order to have a bigger reach, that he not only had to start churches, but he had to make disciples. And part of that disciple making was by pouring his life into a few young men that could pour their life into others that will pour their life into others and therefore impact the world. Two of these young men was a guy named Timothy, which if you have in our Bibles, Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, and then he writes also to Titus. Timothy was saved out of Judaism. Titus was saved out of being a Greek. And it was out of those relationships that he begins to pour into these young men. And we find that now Titus is now in this, this, this church that is started on the island of Crete. Now, we don't have any record of how that church started. We have no record of Paul ever going to Crete to start this church, this church plant. It's estimated that's probably what happened is that when the Jews came to Jerusalem, and we have in Acts chapter 2, we have um, the, the, all these people, uh, Jews from all over the world, coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, that it was at that moment that Pentecost happened, and people began to give their life to Jesus, heard the, heard the gospel in their own language, bowed in need of Jesus, got radically saved, stayed there a little while, discipled, and then this persecution hit the church and they were scattered back into where they came from. And so it's probably those people were saved at Pentecost and now we find them now in Crete that have started this church and now because they're so young, they have no idea how a church is supposed to run. And so Paul writes this letter to Titus to instruct them on how to have a healthy church. That's how he does. And we've discovered over the last several weeks that healthy churches have healthy leaders that lead toward a healthy vision. But that healthy vision leads to something else. That healthy vision empowers us to have a, a healthy mission of our community. Now, in this passage of Titus chapter 3, we're told about this, that what a healthy church, how a healthy church lives on mission. He talks at the very beginning that a healthy church, it is relentless relentlessly promoted to be on mission. The very first words that he says in Titus chapter 3, verse 1 is this, remember, or to remind. He says, remind the people. 
Now, why does he tell us to do that? Well, the verb here to remind is a commitment to do something long-term of doing things. So Paul is telling Titus, hey, the things that I wrote to you and the things I'm about to write to you, I want you to not just remember and to remind them once, but to continually remind them, continually pour into them, telling this young pastor to remind them, to help them not forget. Now, why does he tell us to do that? Because, my friends... (laughs) We are forgetful people, are we not? I mean, come on. Let's just be honest. We are forgetful. This week, I actually started thinking about things that, um, that people around me and myself and my family have forgotten, okay? We forget to return phone calls. If any of these relate to you, you can just raise your hand, okay? We're okay? Uh, we forget to return phone calls. That happened to me Tuesday. I went, oh, man, God called me Friday, and I forgot to call him back. Uh, We forget forget to reply to emails, right? We forget, okay, love it. We forget people's names. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, uh huh? You know how in church you know that they've forgotten your name? They call you brother (laughs) or sister, right? They don't call you by your name. They go, brother, I'm glad you're here today, you know? That's what, that, that's what that means. I can't remember your name, all right? Help them out. Just say, Bob, it's okay, all right? You know me forever. I know, but I can't remember your name today, okay? We forget to send birthday cards. And the reason I put that in there is that tomorrow's my birthday and all of y'all forgot. <laughs> all right? All of y'all forgot. Yeah? We, forgot to, we forget to charge our phones. Does that happen to you? You wake up in the morning and go, oh, man, like that. We forget passwords. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know what I'm talking about, right? We forget words to songs. Yeah. I mean, I've got, I mean, the other day we were, um, you know, my grandson, new grandson, his middle name is Jude. And so all of a sudden, the Beatles song, Hey Jude, came to my head. And I got about a third of the words right. And I mean, it was bad. Okay. Okay. You'll love this one. Okay. We forget where we parked the car. <laughs> There's a reason why there's a button on our new phones. We go, we go like this. You can tell because people go like this. <gasps> right? We forget where we parked our car. Okay? Ladies, I need an amen. Okay? Men forget to put down the toilet seat. <gasps> All right? All right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm married to two wife, two daughters. I've heard it before. Okay? Studies have found that the average person forgets four things a day. And sorry, ladies, to tell you this, that 50%, 56% of guys rely on you to remember things. You know, babe, where did we put the car? Babe, where did we put the kids? Where'd we, babe, where did we, you know, and so we, we rely on, why? And so Paul, I mean, Paul knows what we all know, that we are extremely forgetful people. And so Paul says, hey, all the things I've written to you, the things I'm about to tell you, hey, remind them. Not just once, but continually remind them these things. And, and what are we to be reminded of? And I think it's very appropriate in today's context. One, we are, remind, we are to be reminded to respect. The believe says in verse 1. He says, remind them to submit to rulers and authorities to obey. Verse 2 says, to slander no one, to avoid fighting. Now, in that day, rulers were corrupt. Authorities only looked out for themselves, and they were power hungry. Sound familiar? Mm Mm-hmm. Yet we were told, they were told, and we are told, that we are to submit to and respect those that God has placed in authority. I hate to tell you this, no matter which aisle you fall on, Democrat, Republican, Independent, it doesn't matter your political view, none of this has taken God by surprise. It hasn't. And what does he tell us? How are we supposed to respond? We're going to respond by actually by showing respect. Showing respect. Jesus was once, um, some people tried to corner Jesus on this thing. Because in Roman days, you look at a Roman coin, it has Caesar's image on that coin. For a Jew, this was basically idolatry and heresy. So every time they picked up a coin, they were reminded, this guy calls himself God. 
And we know there's only one God, and it's not Caesar. And so some Pharisees tried to corner Jesus and try to get Jesus to say that we shouldn't follow Caesar. So they got a coin and they said, Jesus, they said, who, who, who are we supposed to follow? Are you supposed to follow uh, God or are we supposed to follow Rome? And Jesus said, give me a coin. And he got a coin and he, he goes, who's, what's this coin? And who's, who's on the front of this coin? Caesar. Well, give unto Caesar who's Caesar's and give it to God's what's God's. Jesus kind of said, hey, government does their thing. But the most important thing is that Jesus does his thing. That's what he tells us to do. I mean, um, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, we are told to pray for those that are in authority over us. And I'll be honest, when I read this, and I keep reading it and continually have to be reminded of this, man, I, I, I'm bad at this. I'm a lot better at criticizing than I am praying. I'm a lot better at complaining about those in authority over me and those that God has placed in political authority over us than I am praying that they succeed and they lead our country well. I'm so bad at this, and probably you are as well. I have a friend that's starting a church in, in, near the campus of U of A and is trying to minister to college students, and every post that you see on Facebook of him is dogging the administration. He was dogging the past administration, dogging this administration, continually just bad-mouthing all the political figures, and he's doing this trying to plant in the most liberal, one of the most liberal campuses in, in, in the Southwest, where you got 35,000 students that don't know Jesus, have never been exposed to Jesus, and the first thing they see about this guy online is him saying what he says about political figures. And this young man has already forgotten that, you know what, it's all about the mission more than that man. It was all about the mission more than it was the previous man. And it'll be all about the mission to the next man or woman that God elects and puts into place of authority. We're told in verse 2 that we are told to slander no one, to avoid fighting. He's saying basically here there's no need for us to talk smack about each other and then post it online. There's no need for us to fight. And there's no reason for us to fight, fight against pre-Jesus people because here's the deal. Pre-Jesus people act like pre-Jesus people, Right? We don't need to get hostile with the unbeliever because the unbeliever is an unbeliever. Unbelievers act like unbelievers. If they didn't, they'd be Jesus people. And so there's no need to get all upset. It's ama isn't it amazing, you know this to be true, how the social media has become a place where people will say things about people that they have never da dare to say it to their face. I, I, I won't say it to your face, but boy, I'll post it about you. I don't like you. Oh, yeah? Send. Post. Right? Like. Dislike. Cancel. Right? That's what we do. And, you know, let me, before you post in your political views or your social views, I think we got to ask ourselves really a couple of questions. One is, will this harm or help Um my Jesus witness in this world. If someone sees this, they go, yeah, this guy's a Jesus follower. Or would just think that I'm an idiot. Most people think I'm an idiot anyway. I don't need any help. <laughs> okay. When I wake up tomorrow, will I be proud or embarrassed about what I post? Will this bring unity or disunity to the body of Christ? Because I guarantee that we took a little poll, not all of us would agree on stuff. But we agree on the mission. We agree about Jesus. Would this, um, would Jesus be pleased with me if I said this about someone? Because again, it's all about the mission. We're told to remember to respect, and then we are also reminded to respond. He tells us how are we supposed to respond. He says, be ready for every good work. It's, it's the picture is that Paul's giving by this is that um, is this, as if you're on a starting block getting ready to take off. I, I'm, I'm ready at any moment. I, 
I, I don't know if you watched the Olympics this year. I love the Olympics. I was so depressed last year when it didn't happen. But I'm really excited that we only have three years to wait till the next one. So I'm very excited. Um, so, uh, and I love the swimming. I've always been enamored by the, the, the swimmers. They're amazing. You get up there, they're long, lanky bodies that don't look like, they, make, they look like they're made out of Gumby, right? I mean, they're just like, <laughs> flop, 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 and then they get out there. But, you know, you see them, man, they're on that starting, getting ready for that whistle to blow. And as soon as that whistle blows, man, they just shoot out there into the water, and they're just suspended out in space until they hit the water and continue the race. And that's what I think of this. I think that we, the Bible tells us that we've got we to be ready for every good work. We've got to be poised, ready, so that we have an opportunity to bless someone else. We have an opportunity to live our life on mission. We have an opportunity to serve that, hey, you know what? We're just looking around for an opportunity here, okay? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man with an op- looking for an opportunity to do something amazing for Jesus. That's what he's saying. So we're to be ready for every good work. We're show to, and he says, then we're to show gentleness to all people. The basic idea is being fair in our treatment of others, an attitude that doesn't hold a grudge, but gives people the benefit of the doubt. So we're to, we're to re, be reminded to respect, we're to be reminded to respond, and then we're also, he tells us in, in this chapter 3, we're being reminded to recall. And what do we recall? First, we recall a life before Jesus. Look what he says in verse 3. He says, For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. He says, We too were once. And we have to be reminded every once in a while that we're not all that. Right? Right? We have to be reminded that there was a day before Jesus. And we need to be reminded of our life before Jesus. And what was our life before Jesus? Well, the Bible tells us we were foolish. The word foolish means we were totally ignorant of God in our need to trust Jesus. We were totally ignorant of Him. And because of that, we were disobedient. We don't need to really explain what that means, right? I mean, all of us understand disobedience right? It means we're basically, we did our own thing. I mean, we, we said no to Jesus, and we did our own thing. It's all about me. And because of that, the Bible says we were deceived. We were purposely led astray. And that's what Satan does. He purposely leads us astray from what is good, what is perfect, what is God's will, his desire, his perfection. He purposely leads us astray from living, my friends, a 4K life. And wants us to live an analog life. That's what he does. He purposely leads us astray. And how does he do it? He tries to tell us that God is holding out on us. The original sin in the garden was Satan telling Adam and Eve, God's holding out on you. You can't trust God. And so we begin to think that we can't trust God, that God's holding out on us somehow. And so we are deceived. And because of that, we go, you know what? I'm going to take things in my own hand. And so I become enslaved by various passions and pleasures, he says. We do our own thing. We got to trust our heart. You know, it's all about my heart. You know, I got to follow my heart. You heard people say that? You don't follow your heart. If I would have followed my heart, I would have been married four times before I met Nancy. (laughs) I mean, goodness, man. From the time I was 14 on, man. Oh, I love you, you know. Praise God. I even, I even, went, to, I even went to one uh, uh, mom and dad, uh, a mom and dad's house of the girl I was dating. I said, I love your daughter. Can I marry her? And they said, no. <laughs> right? You can't trust the heart. The heart's deceitful above all things. And so we pursue these various passions, these various pleasures, thinking somehow it's going to fill the hole that's inside of our lives, that somehow all I have to have is more money, all I have to have is more stuff, all I have to have is the right relationship, and all I have to have is this right pleasure, all I have to have is just do, 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 and have, 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 experience, 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 and somehow it's going to be it's going to provide all kinds of joy and so much cool stuff for me. And then we continue to live that way, and we just get deeper and deeper and deeper into depression. Deeper and deeper and 
deeper into despair because we find out that, man, no matter how much money I've got or I don't have, I don't know how much junk I have that I've got to somehow take care of now, right? And uh, all these relationships that are in my life, they're not fulfilling me. I've been lied to by Satan. And then because of that, then I live in malice because now I become so disheartened that I become evil and I become angry, angry. And then we are envious. Then I start looking at other people and seeing their life and thinking, okay, how come my life's not like that? And I used to get mad instead of getting Jesus. And I start comparing my life with them and to get envious, someone who cannot be satisfied what he has. And he has, you're always craving more. Then which leads us, the Bible says, leads us to being hateful. Is a person that is a person who despises anyone or anything, but st- that stands in their way and disagrees with them. You know what I'm talking about. You maybe have been that person at some time in your life, or you've just been hateful. And then when we become hateful, what is it? We just cannot stand other people. That's what he says. And that was our life before Jesus, and we have to be reminded of that. Because our life is supposed to be a life of mission. He says, that was once your life. But look what he says in verse, the next part of that verse. Verse 4, he says, but. (laughs) I love that one. Thank you, Jesus. You didn't leave us all there. Oh, man. Because last time, the last thing you said is that I can't stand people. (gasps) Right? And then you go, but. When the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to His mercy through the washing of regeneration and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, He poured out to us His Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by His grace, we may become heirs with uh, the hope of eternal life. So we are to remember not only our life before Jesus, now we get to live, remember our life because of Jesus. Jesus has transformed our life. And it happened because nothing that we have done, it has happened because of his kindness, his generosity to our, of his heart, his benevolence. He has graciously saved us, and we must recall his grace. His mercy, His kindness is not because anything that we've done, I mean, come on, really? We think we've done something? No. But because of His kindness, His pursuit of you, His love for you, His desire for you, and His love and desire for me, that He has given us grace. And he's, he's, because He's pursued us, He has poured out lavishly upon us His Spirit so that our old, dead decaying stench has been washed away and we've been given a new life. We have been born fresh. That's pretty cool. As you know, I got a new grandson. And unlike what you may see online, he's not perfect. Okay? My wife has a way of take, showing only the nice pictures. And... Uh, and the ones that he's not throwing up or spitting up, okay, or not crying. And so, um, um, but he is adorable. So I, find, I finally got to hold my grandson. And I say finally because I'm way down the list. First, of course, it's Sarah, which she should be. She's the mama. I mean, you know, that she should have the right to hold the baby first, right? And then, and then, it's, then it's my wife. She, I, you know, I'll explain very clearly that she's next. Uh, and then Aria. Of all, I mean, my three-year-old granddaughter somehow has precedence over me. And then, then finally, finally, I get to hold my, I finally got to hold my grandson. I mean, and he, I mean, I hate to say it, but he's pretty cute. He's actually cuter than all the rest of them that we've had. Okay. Um, uh, and, and you see, you, don't, don't tell the rest of them that, okay? Because uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say I didn't say it and I'll. Call, I'll, I'll call you a liar, and then you'll call me a liar. And, and we've got it on tape, and nobody will know that I'm a liar. Um, so, um, so, so we, we have this, I mean, it's just this freshness. That's what I love about babies is that freshness, that newness. And, and it reminds me that just Jesus does this for us. He saved us from our old dead life. 
and he's resurrected us by his spirit, renewed our lives, given us a freshness about our lives, a hope for the future for our lives, so much so that now that we have given our lives to Jesus, it says we have been justified, I love that verse, we've been justified by his grace. The word justified here, what does it mean? It means that we have been um, made just, um, just as if we've never sinned. That's what it means. It means as if I've never sinned, that's what Jesus has done for me. He's, he's pursued me so much that he's cast my sins as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more. I have been justified, not because of something that I've done, but because of what Jesus has done for me. He died on the cross for me. He resurrected on the third day for me. He sits at the right hand of the Father for me. He gives intercession daily for me. He loves me so much that he blesses me. He takes care of me. He pursues me. He desires me. And because of his grace to me, I have now been justified before a holy God not because of what I've done, because of what Jesus has done, and it's the same for you. And when we give our lives to Jesus, he says that we have become now heirs with the hope of eternal life. Galatians 4, 7 says, so you're no longer slave but a son, and if a son, then God has made you an heir. So a healthy church, he says, is a relentlessly promoted to be on mission. But a, also, a healthy church has an unwavering plan to stay on mission. Because, my friends, it's so easy to get off mission. That's what I love about this church is continually, that's what it talks about. This church here talks about mission all the time. How are we going to reach people? How are we going to share the gospel with people? And he tells us how we're to do that. He says, he, he basically says at the very beginning, it insists. A church that has this unwavering plan, it insists. Verse 8. It says, thus saying, this saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who believe God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. Um, these are good and profitable for everyone. The Greek word verb for this insist means to keep it a habit to continually. He's saying, so our unwavering plan is to remember what Jesus has done for me, through me, despite me, and to be careful to remember that that's why we're here. We are on mission. He tells us we are, he insisted. And then we also, he tells us we are to avoid certain things. He says, verse 9, he says, but avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels, disputes about the law because they are unprofitable and worthless. He's saying, hey, church, Concentrate on the main thing. Because it's so easy for a church, a group of people, to start concentrating on things that are not important. It doesn't matter. The most important thing is the mission. The mission. This community around here, in a three-mile radius of this church, has 151,951 people. Almost 152,000 people live within a three-mile radius of this church. That's a lot of folk, right? That's my Oklahoma coming out. That's a lot of folk. That's a lot of people that need to hear Jesus. We don't have time to quarrel about genealogies, quarrel about theology, quarrel about when Jesus is coming back. Let me just say he's coming back, okay? We, we have, there's no need for us to debate and quarrel and fight amongst each other. The main thing is the main thing. And the main thing is that Jesus came to save sinners. And guess what? We are a beacon of hope for this community that needs to hear about Jesus. And when people do that all the time, he tells us we are to reject. He says, reject a divisive person after a first or second warning. For you know that such a person has gone astray and is sinning. He is self-condemned. He said... Listen, there are some people that just, you'll know these people, okay? Don't look around, okay? There's just some people that just like to argue. They like to argue. They like to divide, uh, debate. They love to divide, and they love to destroy. They love to post things online just to get someone else's attention, to see how people react. And what are we to do about them? Well, first thing we're to do is what the Bible says. We're to go talk to them. Say, dude, dude, dude. Man, come on. 
Let's stop this mess. There's no need for us to do that because it's, it's, focusing us, foc- it's taking our focus off the mission and to these other little things. So stop, stop. And if they don't stop, what does he tell us to do? He tells us to cancel them. Cancel them. Don't listen to them anymore. If they won't stop, delete them from your Facebook post. Just unfriend, you're gone. People have done that to me all the, all the time. You keep talking about University of Oklahoma stuff. I can't stand Oklahoma. Delete. Um, you know, it's just the. It's okay. You don't just don't don't listen to them anymore. Don't don't be in an environment where you have to listen to that anymore because the mission is the main thing. When does the church stop being effective? When it stops being on mission. When we focus on arguments rather than our assignment. When we focus on the minors, and not focus on the master. That's when a church loses its mission. Verse 14, he closes the book of Titus with this admonition. He says, let our people learn to devote themselves. And that that means to focus exclusively, okay, to good works for pressing needs so they will not be unfruitful. What are we to do? We're to do good works for pressing needs so that we will not be unfruitful. This church, I love this church. It's one of the reasons why I said if I hadn't already started a church and part of that church, this is the church I would be at. And um, um, this church loves to live its life on mission. The church that Paul's asking, writing this letter to, is trying to help them learn and devote themselves to doing something that will last. To be fruitful. To be productive. To be meaningful. For a church, a group of people, you and I, to live our life on mission. To keep the main thing the main thing. That's why we're here. It's for those of you that do not know Jesus you know that if you do not know Jesus the Holy Spirit's already telling you, you don't know me you come to church you're trying it out but it's now time for you to surrender to me we want to our prayer for you is that you experience the Jesus that we know now if you're looking for a perfect church, you're not going to find it here because there's not perfect people here all the bunch of people here there's just people that have said yes to Jesus and Jesus is pouring into them to become like him so if you're looking for perfect people, maybe you got to go somewhere else. But if you're looking for real people, this is maybe where God's got you. And so our desire is that you give your life to Jesus. That's our desire for you. And for those of us that have said yes to Jesus, we don't let other things distract us from our call to tell people about Jesus. Let's pray.